So, so I'd, I'd like to welcome everybody to the LRMI Metadata in Use panel session of the DCMI virtual event. And I'd like to start off by thanking the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, especially Tom Baker and Paul Walk, who've put so much work into organizing the DCMI virtual event over the last few months. And I'd like to thank them for inviting us to give a presentation. Quick overview of what this panel session is going to involve. It's going to start with an introduction to LRMI metadata from myself. Um, and then we're going to have three 15 minute um, presentations on different ways that LRMI is being used. Um, the first one will be from Adrian Pohl, who has been developing a JSON LD based LRMI metadata profile um, for use with. Um, educational resources in Germany. Uh, the second one will be by Steve Midgley and myself, uh, where we'll describe how we've been using schema.org and LRMI to describe curriculum materials. And the third one is going to be from uh, Brant Red and Michael J, um, who will talk about using LRMI as the foundation for a dynamic matching system. We'll follow this with um, 30 minutes of question and discussions. So even though this is a remote event, yeah, um, held over a video conference, we want there to be as much audience participation as possible. You know, even though we can't all be in the same room, which I think is what most of us would prefer for this type of participation, we do want people to ask questions and to spark some discussion around the topics that we raise. Um, so the protocol for doing that is to ask questions in the chat window of Zoom during the presentations and we'll deal with all of the questions at the end in the discussion session after all four presentations. Um, if you'd like to ask your question yourself we can arrange for that. Um, at the moment all the attendee microphones are muted but we can unmute the microphone so you can ask your question yourself otherwise um, I'll read them out for you. Um, the session is being recorded um, so in order to respect your privacy Unless you ask for us to include your name, um, the questions that I read out will be read out anonymously. Uh, and the recording will be available after the session for people who've, um, for, for people who've registered for DCMI Virtual. And later, after DCMI Virtual has finished in, in a month or so, there'll be a recording of the session that's made publicly available. Most of the materials that we're using during, during this session are available. Uh, we have a Google Doc with extra links which includes links to the presentations at the URL that you can see at the bottom of your screen but also feel free to use Twitter or any other back channel that you wish in order to discuss what we're saying. So I'd like to move now into um, the first substan substantive part of the session which is an introduction to LOMI metadata, um, what it is and uh, why we do it. Um, it gives me an opportunity to introduce myself a little bit more thoroughly. Uh, my name's Phil Barker. Uh, I'm the chair of the DCMI LOMI task group, and you can see my contact details down there. And I would like to start with an overview of the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative. Um, in two parts. First of all, describing it as a set of properties, classes, concept schemes that can be used to describe educational characteristics of learning resources, but also to talk about the DCMI task group, which goes by the same name, uh, which curates those um, terms and concept schemes. And I want to start with a little bit of a historical perspective. Um, I, I like to start with this um, picture, especially when I'm presenting to a Dublin Core audience, because it goes back to 2008, to um, the Dublin Core Education uh, Community Group, and a domain model that was created at that time to try and describe um, what an application profile 
for learning resources would look at. And the important idea behind this domain model is that a learning resource has two aspects to it. Um, it's some form of resource, e.g. You know, it could be a book, a video, an audio file, a simulation, even a tin of custard, anything. Um, and secondly, it's something that's intended or used for learning. And earlier meta metadata specifications had tried to describe the aspects of the learning resource as a resource and the educational characteristics. Um, and they found that about 90% of the standard that they produced when they tried to do this was just there to describe the resource as a book or as a video or as a simulation, that there was nothing special about the educational side of it in 90% of the scheme. Um, a commitment to RDF allowed us to use vocabularies that were specific to a particular resource type to describe those characteristics, um, you know, as you would with any other book, any other video, um, any other simulation, um, and to use a metadata schema that focused on the educational characteristics. So the education community group came up with this idea that the application profile where it needed new terms would focus only on the uh, the educational characteristics um, and would leave the characteristics of a resource um, just as a book as a video as being out of scope for the education side of it um, that work uh, faltered uh, it didn't progress much beyond the uh, the domain model which i, I showed there um, and LOMI picked up then around 2011 when um, schema.org was launched. Schema.org, you may well know, is a vocabulary that can be used for describing many aspects of many types of resource um, that are on the web or that, that have some sort of web presence. Whether it's a book, whether it's a video, whether it's an event, whether it's um, a, a bus trip, whatever, that there's um, part of the schema.org vocabulary that can be used to describe it. But in 2011, it didn't have anything that could describe educational characteristics. So at about the same time, LOMI was launched as a project to develop a set of properties and classes to augment schema.org for the description of learning resources. It was a three-year project that was led by the Association of Education Publishers and Creative Commons. It was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the William and Flo Flora Hewlett Foundation. Um, it successfully contributed 14 properties and two classes to schema.org, which I'll come back to look at. In 2013, th those classes were added to schema.org. And in 2014, when the project came to an end, curation and further development of LOMI was transferred to Dublin Core. And at the same time, LOMI 1.1 became a, a Dublin Core community specification. In a year, the year after that, the individual terms in RDF were added to, as a DCMI community specification. And in 2017, we added sets of concept schemes that can be used to provide values for some of those terms. And that brings us up to now when the LOMI task group continues to curate LRMI, both in schema.org and the DCMI namespaces. So what is LRMI now? Um, first, I want to look at it as a set of concepts, schemes and terms. Um, I've listed on the screen, you can see now um, the properties and classes that are currently in um, schema.org. And most of these are also in the Dublin Core namespace. Um, some of them are fairly new to schema.org and it, it's current work for the task group to put them into the Dublin Core namespace. Rather than try and run through all of these properties individually and give them definitions, which is a kind of very dry and boring thing to do, um, I prefer to show you a couple of examples of what they might look like in use. So here's some JSON-LD um, describing a lesson plan. Uh, and if you prefer your metadata as pictures, if you prefer your RDF as circles and arrows, um, 
here you have a, a diagram of the same graph. So you see that we've got a learning resource, which is called Lesson, the Declaration of Our Growth, which is about the Declaration of Our Growth. And you'll see from the JSON-LD that I've used an identifier from Wikidata to, um, to, 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 to identify the, the subject, the Declaration of Our Growth, and you can go there to find out more about what that declaration is and why it's significant. The learning resource itself is a lesson plan, so that's what we have for learning resource type. And with lesson plans, you come across something that's quite, uh, quite tricky for the audience and the age range, which is that the intended audience of a lesson plan is teachers. So we have an audience, which is an educational audience with the education role of teacher. Um, however, the lesson itself is intended for school children who have a typical age range of 10 to 12, uh, which is the reason why the typical age range property is a property of the learning resource and not of the audience. Um, an alternative way of providing that information um, is to talk about the educational level of the content of the resource, which I've done here in terms of a defined term, which is basically an entry in a, uh, a framework uh, um, in, a, in a dictionary, if you like, um, which in this case is the defined term set that's described by, or specified rather than the, by the SQ, SCQF, which is the Scottish Curriculum and Qualifications Framework, um, and it's at level two in that framework. That doesn't mean an awful lot to most of you, I imagine, but if you happen to be teaching in a school in Scotland, it will mean everything to you. A second example is of a quiz. And again, let's have the, um, the, the metadata as a, as a visual graph. So you can see this time we have um, a learning resource, which is of a type quiz called, can you ask? So can you add? Its educational use is for formative assessment. And the audience in this case is fairly simple. It's for learners with a typical age range of six. And the educational alignment here is that it assesses a, um, a topic from the US Common Core state standards relating to add and subtract numbers within 20. So there's a couple of examples of LOMI uh, metadata. You'll be seeing a lot more from the presentations that we have following this. The other aspect of what LOMI is now is the um, DCMI task group, which is charged with defining and executing DCMI work on the LOMI family of metadata specifications and the related activities necessary to their stewardship and adoption. Um, so this includes work to make sure that um, LOMI within schema.org is kept harmonized within uh, the LOMI properties that we have in DCMI and also liaising with other specification and standards bodies that might be wanting to use uh, LOMI for educational metadata. We're not a specification or standards body ourselves, but we do have significant overlap of membership with such organizations. Uh, and if you are creating a, um, a specification or a standard to describe educational resources, we'd welcome your input to the task group. You can join the task group simply by joining the task group mailing list. Um, there's a URL for it there. Um, we have monthly calls on the first Tuesday at 0700 Pacific time. These are advertised, the agenda goes onto the task group mailing list. If you're interested, but don't want to be quite so committed, um, then we have a, an outreach Google group, Google group where we post um, notices about the activity relating to um, LRMI and also we encourage debate and discussion there about the use of LRMI. But to be honest, that, that's a fairly quiet Google group, so don't be put off joining it because you think there might be too, tra too much traffic on there. That completes what I want to say about LOMI by way of introduction. Uh, we now move into three presentations from um, people who have used LOMI uh, in practical applications. So I will stop my screen share 
and hand over to Adrian Pohl, who's going to be talking about um, developing a JSON-LD-based LOMI metadata profile. Jason, um, sorry, Adrian, over to you. <laughs> yeah, hello, thank you, Phil. Um, okay, I pre-recorded my talk, so I will just share my screen if I find. My name is Adrian. I call myself a web librarian these days. For more than 10 years, I have been working with metadata on the web and especially with linked open data. Um, I work at the HPZ in Cologne, Germany. Our open infrastructure team focuses on providing Lobbit, uh, Lobbit.org and we also have a lot to do with OER metadata and infrastructure, for example, in the SCOHUB project and the Earthy OER search index project. I initiated an OER metadata group um, where we come together to prevent parallel work uh, with regard to OER metadata and to define uh, recommendations. Let's recap what a metadata profile actually does uh, before diving into the, a specific profile. Um, it basically, it's a definition of how existing vocabularies or metadata schemas are reused uh, in an application or in a community um, by indicating which properties and types from these ex existing metadata schemas are used and what constraints um, uh, for their usage are uh, there, um, like mandatory fields, cardinality, value constraints, etc. Tom Baker and Karen Coyle um, at SWIP19 have nicely illustrated in what different ways a profile can reuse existing profiles. It might be a subset set of a main vocabulary, or it uh, could be, you could use a main vocabulary and other vocabularies. Uh, and at, at those two, or it might, might take subsets of different vocabularies to, um, to define this profile. What can a profile look like? Um, yeah, there are many different ways. One is um, a human readable, human only readable document like a PDF, or you can define machine re readable machine readable schemas for specific um, formats, for example, an XML schema or JSON schema. Um, you could use a, a something like Shex or Shackle to define graph shapes for RDF data. Um, and in the future, you might use um, the Dublin Core Application Profile Core Vocabulary, which is a, which um, will um, let you define a, an application profile using a metadata profile using tabula, tabular data. And there are probably lots of other ways to define and publish your, your um, metadata profile. So let's now move on to concrete profile, um, an LMI profile for higher education OER. So there might be too many acronyms. Um, OER means Open Educational Resources, um, which are free, accessible, and openly licensed uh, for, for teaching and learning. And LMI, I think, Phil already cleared that up in the introduction, so I don't have to go there. Um, why do we are we working on an LM, LMI profile? Um, there's more than one motive for developing this profile. Here are three of them. Um, there, there's for one great interest in LMI in the German-speaking OER community, but there, are, there, there haven't been any easy instructions for implementation. And yeah, 
and, and I already mentioned OERC, the OER search index, which we are working on. And there we, we are in need of a standards oriented JSON schema um, for, for learning resources metadata um, to, to um, yeah, as, as an index schema for um, which we can um, normalize all the data into. And yeah, there, there already exists a long, long based XML, XML profile for um, describing OER. Um, it was also developed within Kim, but but we want to. Yeah, we are we are working with with HTTP and JSON and web APIs, and we and we think this is, this approach is more future proof, and this is what we actually need now. For taking. A brief look at the profile itself, I want to present the process of developing it. Um, the profile is be, being developed as a JSON schema first, um, and which defines the fields, the, the value types, and, the, and which controlled vocabularies are, are used. And the controlled vocabularies um, are published separately as SCOS files and are referenced in the schema. And this schema then can uh, can be tried out in the SCOAP editor. Um, I will show you um, soon. Um, um, and so you you can try it you can try it out how it works and and look up the vocabularies and and all this. So as we focus on the JSON schema first, uh, we will not have a human readable documentation of, of the metadata profile until the end of the process. Um, however, um, the profile is exemplified and can be tried out in the SCOAP editor, as I already said. So let's take a look at how this actually works. Um, let's take a look at the JSON schema and the SCOAP editor. This is the editor. Um, you can type in some data here, and then you will see the the JSON coming out uh, uh, from the what you typed in here, and can copy it and use it or or do other things with it. With it, and um, yes. So how do I configure this editor? Um, how how does a JSON schema work? Um, for example, I can this part of the schema. Um, Defines the property name, which will appear as title in the in the editor, and which expects an um, unconstrained string. And this is what it looks like in the editor then. And this one adds the field image um, to the to the JSON data which will be shown as image in the editor and which it expects a, a string of format URI. And as you can see, I can also define a, a placeholder for the web form here in the schema, which is quite nice. This will look like this. Then I have this empty field with a placeholder. If I put in an image, everything is OK. If I put in something, uh, if I put in an, a URL to an image, everything is OK. If, if I put in something that is not the URL, um, there will be a, an, an error message. So as you can see, the JSON schema is not only used for building the web form, but also for validating the input. You can also enumerate possible values for a field, like we do here for the type field using types from schema.org. And th these were then sh uh, shown in a, in a drop down um, suggested in the web form. This is how it looks like when I, I re reference the SCOS vocabulary by using the um, by adding the SCOHUB lookup widget here, and by by saying which uh, uh, in scheme in which scheme the the, the reference SCOS concept should should uh, reside. This is what it looks like in the editor. Then, yeah. It's not. It's uh, you, you can look up the the concepts from the SCOS scheme and then um, choose them to be added to the about field, the subject field. What I really like about this setup um, are the automatic tests. 
Um, the, the schema is tested against two sets uh, of, of, day, uh, of files, valid JSON files and invalid JSON files. And whenever we notice a file that is invalid, and, but the schema doesn't catch this, um, we, we add the file to the invalid folder, update the schema so that the tests pass, and then the schema will be stricter and better, and we are moving on. And also, these example files are helpful for people who are implementing the profile. They can, can take a look at them as examples. Okay, going back to the to these uh, controlled values, where, where exactly do these values come from? I already um, uh, talked about SCOS and SCOAP. I mentioned them uh, before. So let's take a brief look um, about uh, at how this works exactly. Um, these controlled vocabularies must be published with Scohub vocabs, which is one Scohub uh, module. And this works like this. You you um, publish a, a turtle RDF file on GitHub or GitLab. Both are supported um, and maintain them there, can edit there. And whenever you, and you set up a webhook uh, in your settings, um, and whenever you, you change something in your SCOS concept scheme, um, the, the, the voc vocabulary will be built, um, will be newly built on SCOHUB, um, having a nice HTML UI for, for humans to read, but you, uh, there's also JSON LD is RDF serialization under the hood. And yeah, there's a, a blog post linked here if you want to know the details and how to try it out yourself. Uh, this is what it looks like. Here's this uh, subject classification in German um, uh, we are using in the Scope Editor. It's published on GitHub as turtle file. And this is what it looks like in Scohub when the when it's published via the webhook. Okay, I've talked about the process now, but you probably want to know something uh, from the schema, the LMI data. Um, here are a few examples. Um, I will focus on the thing that might not be uh, the normal stuff, but it might be of interest to others. Um, one thing, as you can see, we, we, in JSON-LD, you add this context. Um, for, for declaring namespaces, basically. As you can see here, we're using schema org vocab as, um, as the base vocab, and but we're also adding some SCOS um, vocabulary, uh, some SCOS properties we are using. So basically, this is kind of example we had before, a, a metadata profile which, which uses a subset of schema.org plus a subset of SCOS. Um, we recently implemented some kind of localization. Um, for one thing, we, we found it uh, important to to add the language of, of the metadata. The metadata is um, written in, uh, so the language uh, OER is described in to the to the metadata, and this can be done by by adding a um, default language in the context. I say add language de each field each literal string in the in the data will be tagged with with de with german um, but we also have the possibility for for the for the values from the controlled vocabulary to to add different languages so if we, if we have our, our um scott vocabulary with English, German, or with multilingual labels, and we can also add them to the to the JSON data. Here, for example, we have this concept N222 from the Hochschulfächer Systematik, and you could add the PREF label in German and in English. Another thing we added in the context of, of um, the OER search index was this uh, main entity of page property uh, array um, 
from from schema.org uh, comes to to add some meta metadata so basically this in this object we are we are talking about the where the metadata itself comes from we say we have this provider it's a re OER repository we got it from and when and we get some information on when the data was created there and yeah and we could even add um, additional um, meta metadata from different sources if we get the same OER described in different sources and we deduplicate this we can add the meta metadata for those for all those resources to this array which uh, is quite useful. Yeah, so that that what that's what that was is the my my brief look into what we are working on and um, thanks for watching. And if you want to take a look at the details or want to use some scope components or whatever, here are some links um, you could follow. Thank you, Adrian. I can only imagine what it must be like to actually sit in a conference room and watch a recording of your own presentation. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as, as I imagined. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Thank, it was good. It was fine. Thank you very much. The, the next presentation is um, Steve, Midley, Steve Mitchley from Learning Tapestry and myself um, talking about K12 OCX. OCX stands for Open Content Exchange. Um, Steve and I are going to do this as a, as a double act. Um, Steve talking to the first few slides and me turning the pages, and then I'll take over to do the central, the, the, the middle part of the presentation. So Steve, um, take it away. All right. So uh, humor is always a little challenging at uh, a conference where we can't see or hear each other, but um, I'll let you enjoy this little meme for a minute. All I'm trying to get to here is um, that there are components to trying to fit content into um, the systems that use it that um, don't always fit. And so it can be a little bit frustrating, as I'm sure um, the drivers of this vehicle were feeling. So we can we can move on to actual content, but. Um, so just thinking that through in a more concrete sense around the problem that we were working on with this project called OCX, which stands for Open Content Exchange, um, which is recognizing that in particular with OER, we have um, useful digital content that then gets expressed in various bindings or formats, PDFs, Word Docs, Google Docs, and HTML is the sort of primary places where it stems out into. And then once we have them in those formats, we try to stuff them under the bridge and get them into an LMS or an assessment system of some kind. And that is the not fun part. So uh, Adrian was talking about, I think if I followed some of his work and Adrian, feel free to correct as we go along here, the, um, the discovery and characterization of content and then once you've solved for that, what we're trying to talk about is the ingestion and, and sort of use of that content. And some specific things, just to give you examples of how this works, LMSs often think of things like assignments, but textbooks often think of things like lessons. And that's a, that's a sort of categorical mismatch. <clears throat> in many cases, a lesson is made up of several assignments, some that happen in class, some that happen as homework, some that's a quiz or, right, a measure of progress, right? There's all kinds of different things that feature in and around a learning activity. And these documents often characterize that as style rather than content. So you can tell when you're in an assignment because it's bolded in a red sort of bar along and then now the content starts. So you can visually process it, but of course the metadata is inferred by the, by the styling and that's often the problem that we're trying to deal with here. Okay, so we can move on to dig into subject matter. So just to voice over some of this stuff, um, as I, I was saying, once you put it in the LMS, the information isn't present any longer. So you load a PDF into an LMS and the LMS doesn't understand 
what is inside that PDF. And so you're leaving the job of the instruction to only the instructor and only the content author and the systems and tools in between are sort of just a conveyor, which is less than what LMSs are capable of doing, which is why I think a lot of people are sort of view LMSs as a frustrating um, environment. And there's a lot of mismatching and, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So it just feels like a very poorly designed system because the content isn't aligned to the system well. Um, I think the second point is really critical here, which is we're not talking about enriching metadata with new information. We're talking about information that the, the people that wrote the content know, and then they threw away when they put it into the PDF or into the Google Doc or whatever, and it only lives as style. So we're just asking to preserve information that was known when the content was created. Uh, and then the idea is that, that therefore LMS and other systems, even reauthoring platforms for the OER community can leverage some of that structural information that the original authors knew. And if we just ask them to record it, we could potentially make the whole ecosystem uh, uh, easier to engage with. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so as I said, we're describing and sharing content between the authors and the content systems, the LMSs and so forth. That's the goal is to share that information. Um, what was present prior to OCX was something along the or, or lines of providing hierarchical structures like tables of content that the uh, common cartridges we'll talk about in a minute has that kind of structure, which is great. And we need that. And you'll see how these things work together. But the classifications around an entire book or entire section of a book, uh, but they don't get into the use of the resource itself, which is what we're trying to get to in OCX. And Phil will give you a very detailed view of that. Um, and, and in order to undertake this R&D funding that we've been doing around this issue, just give credit to the Gates Foundation and, and Chen Zuckerberg for giving us a runway to just flesh out this concept as far as we have. All right, next slide. Um, so then just speaking to the components of this, um, Common Cartridge and LTI or SCORM are very useful for moving content around and we don't propose to change that, that those tools work and they can continue to work. But they don't give you enough information about what's inside the content. And that's what OCX is trying to provide. Uh, and critically, OCX is bridging that gap, not as a solution that's plug and play, but it's communicating information between two parties so that the team doing the LMS import has better knowledge as to how to align the content into the system, which means that writing custom importers and other things uh, are more viable. Eventually, we could expect to see a more rigid OCX structure that is sort of plug and play. But in these early days of this project, we're really talking about communicating knowledge and making it more efficient and accurate to transfer this content into the, uh, into the destination systems rather than just making them completely uh, rigid document structures. Uh, so that's, uh, that's that. And then, uh, Phil, I think, uh, we can change over to you and uh, and and dig further into the document structure. Yep, this looks like me. I'm going to talk about the metadata approach that we took for Open Content Exchange, and we created a content model, structural metadata to show how the different parts of content fitted together, and descriptive metadata to describe the individual pieces of content at various different levels of, of aggregation within the structure. Um, and what I want to emphasize right from the very beginning is that we tried not to invent anything. We used existing standards and specifications. So the content was represented in HTML. The metadata is represented in JSON-LD embedded within that HTML. Um, the metadata vocabularies that we used were built very heavily on um, schema.org and LOMI within properties within schema.org, but also on um, a, another very useful metadata specification called OER schema. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more. Yeah, I'll talk about what that adds into the mix as I go through the details. And you will see influences from lots of other specifications from SCORM, EPUB, 
sitemaps, OAIORE, if you remember that, um, object reuse and exchange uh, from Resource Sync uh, and several others. Um, we have the specification written up, which you can read on GitHub uh, at the URL that's um, given at the bottom of that page there. So the first thing that I, I mentioned we created was a, a content model. Uh, and this is built quite heavily on OER schema. Um, it, it gives us the components of a course and a means to describe the logical and more importantly, the pedagogic relationships between them. So what I'm showing in this diagram here is um, are, are the most important entities within the content model, the primary entities, if you like. Um, starting with a course that's broken down into modules. Modules can be broken down into units. Units can be broken down into lessons uh, and um, lessons comprise activities. Uh, it doesn't matter if you go straight from a, a course to a lesson or, you know, if, or if you just skip out module or even if you give them different names, you know, logically or all we're taking here is that there are um, divisions within courses which relate to um, the topics that are being addressed. Um, at any of those divisions, you, you can have an assessment to see how well a student has fared um, or as preparation for the, um, for, 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 for the section of the course, um, a, a formative, summative, diagnostic assessment. And also attached to any of these, you, you have associated material, which are things like the um, um, the, 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 the syllabus um, explanations perhaps for um, parents or for learners about what's going to be covered. Um, uh, the, if, for example, you're giving a, a literature class, um, the book that's being studied, you know, the novel that the students are studying would be classed as um, associated material. I've also not shown some of the other um, uh, parts of the content model, which are topics that are being studied and um, learning objectives, uh, which can be related to any part of the, um, the, the course to activity hierarchy. Um, typically, each component is represented as an HTML page, i.e. there'll be a page for each module, a page for each unit, a page for each lesson. Um, and schema.org can provide relationships to give um, structural metadata um, to show how these relate to each other. Um, it can be done quite simply saying that, you know, a module has parts which are units, unit, units have parts which are lessons. Uh, and that's quite simple if you don't care too much about the ordering of these. However, once you start to care about the ordering, um, things can get a lot more complicated. Um, uh, and this is where you, you come up with something which is a, a union of schema.org item lists, OER schema, and the OAI object reuse and exchange specification. Um, I am not sure if this is a, a Baroque beauty or a Gothic monstrosity, um, but it's certainly complicated or complex. And only feedback from implementation will tell us whether it's been over-engineered or not, because there is an alternative, which is just to use a simple default order list. An example of between, between page structuring shown as JSON LD um, shows here that um, this particular graph uh, so the, the, the logical structure comes from the schema.org properties as part and the pedagogic structure comes from the OER schema types which relates the individual parts back to the content model um, that I presented a little bit earlier. At some point you get to divisions that don't get their own page. Um, so for the example that I've chosen here, a lesson plan might be a single page that comprises uh, an introduction and several activities. Um, so here again, um, okay, so, so what we've done here is we've used the HTML section and content elements to give some indication of the, um, the, the semantics of the 
uh, the HTML within the page to, to say that there's you know, a main part which comprises all of the OCX content. The sections that are out with that main part, the header and the footer, are not part of the OCX content. They, they can include things like branding, um, things like links to other pages that are relevant to the organisation that's providing the course. You know, they're, they're, not intellectual, they're not intellectually part of the lesson plan. Um, and then within that main element, you have sections that represent um, an introduction and, and an activity. And the structural metadata can be added to describe the relationship between the parts in the page. Uh, again, using schema.org has part property to link to the, um, the, the activity and the introduction within that main section. And the, um, uh, the OER schema properties provide information about how those um, sections relate to the content model. We've created what amounts to an application profile of schema.org, uh, LRMI, and OER schema for each of the main entity types in the content model to provide descriptive metadata. Um, the JSON-LD is embedded in the HTML page, so it travels with the content. Um, it doesn't get lost uh, when uh, the content is embed, you know, sent from the publisher to the end user, um, when it's embedded in a, a repository or a VLE or learning management system. Um, and we hope that it supports discovery of alternative, more contextually appropriate content. So um, in this um, example, um, content matching would be based on the properties that you can find in that JSON-LD that relate to the time required, the educational use, um, the alignment, educational alignment, which in this case is that it assesses a common core state standard. This is information that's commonly held in publishers' um, databases of content when they are um, putting courses together um, and normally gets lost, uh, as um, Steve was describing, when that content is published as a, um, a, as a PDF or as Word documents. Here, we're keeping all of that information that the uh, the authors knew when they created the resource and the publishers knew when they published it, we're keeping it embedded as descriptive metadata. Okay, so that's it for the technical side. Um, Steve, do you want to cover this last slide? Sure, so, um, th I mean, this is um, fairly straightforward, but as Phil said, uh, we're working on an open profile that imports um, and, and organizes metadata from several different sources, schema.org, LRMI, and OER schema. Uh, notably, the way that we've constructed this as a sort of uh, GitHub project with um, abstraction of metadata and, uh, and then a, a representation model, it's fairly easy for us to take pull requests or to coordinate with people to extend the vocabulary. So if there are other vocabularies that belong here or that you want to use this, we've essentially, as many projects are doing, created a specification as code approach so that you can get involved in, in what we're up to both as a consumer and as a creator and contributor to the uh, specification. So with that in mind, there's a Slack community that we can share. Uh, and unfortunately, these are links. So I think there'll be some way to access these slides um, after the fact so you can get access to the actual URLs underneath those links. Um, as I mentioned, this GitHub community where you can send us pull requests to improve. You can also create issues to discuss. Uh, and then the DC LRI community itself is foundational to this. And insofar as you want to engage on the sort of really meaty topics of, you know, defining uh, learning vocabulary, that's the place to go. Uh, so yeah, we'd welcome any contact. If you have any questions for Phil or myself, our emails are, uh, are below. And uh, so we We'd be happy to, if you can use those to direct you as well into these other communities if you're interested in getting involved. Okay, thank you. So 
that's um, everything from Steve and myself. And we hand over to another double act, um, Grant Fred and Michael J of Matchmaker Labs um, to talk about uh, how they match content to educational requirements. Do you want to share your screen, Grant? Yep, I think it should be up for everyone to see. Okay. So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so yes, uh, we are representing Matchmaker Education Labs, but uh, Michael Jay and I have a long history. Uh, both of us were involved in the early days of LRMI. In fact, that's where we met each other, uh, was through LRMI. So it was uh, a great opportunity and much has come out of that since then. Um, so uh, we're going to, uh, I'm actually going to let Michael present a bit about who we are and what we're involved in. And, uh, and then I will take over. We're actually going to do a demo uh, today. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to show you active code. Uh, this is a project, a, a prototype we've been working on and, uh, and you get to be the first ones to see it publicly. So uh, that should be fun. So go ahead, Michael. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brant. And thanks everybody. Good to see everybody on the, on the call here today. Um, uh, we're, as Brant already mentioned, we're a startup focused on a new product based on some, what we think certainly are innovative core technologies and certainly those who we share it with um, are aware of that. Um, we'll be creating products for many different learning markets. In the past, my background's in K through 12 education, but in fact, the work that we're doing is appropriate across anything that is competency based. Go ahead, Brant, should I do the B? Yeah. Beep. Yeah, beep. Um, <laughs> I'll follow along, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, we're focused on uh, B2B partnerships um, and uh, being a key component of uh, aspect of our market strategy in the past. Um, when I started doing this work well over 20 years ago, um, there were no applications to be consumers of the kind of data we were creating. And so we had to create that. I'm very, very happy to say that the market has actually advanced in that period of time. And so we don't have to create the consumer of these data, but uh, instead are now really looking at ways that we can serve the needs of the larger community. Um, as I mentioned, we have an enabling technology that we intend to uh, allow others to use to create new and innovative products and solutions. So part of us sharing this with you today is not just to um, show our LRMI roots, but also um, to entice you to contact us and we'd be happy to, to tell you more than we certainly can on this in this presentation. Uh, so we're really working towards an open sustainable model. Um, uh, right now it requires uh, a certain amount of internal workings and collaborating with um, particular organizations, but we are working towards an open uh, model that supports the community as a, as a whole. And again, happy to answer questions around that. Um, our history is that this actually started with some work that I did. I know I don't look at day over 29, but um, uh, started with some work that I did with the uh, California Tech tech guides um, and looking at aligning uh, learning resources to standards. So this is, of course, not a new problem by any means um, and has been an issue. And I can't tell you the long hours that I spent uh, uh, working on that. I said, even back then, the, in the days of old Apple IIs, I said, there's got to be an easier way to do this. So um, have really spent a lot of my career pursuing this approach, resulted in many mistakes and refinements. Um, so uh, an early iteration was commercialized by MediaSeq Technologies um, and the foundational process um, that you'll see has really become a best practice in the market. And yet there are critical insights uh, regarding how we structure um, and implement these kinds of technologies that are really help capture the more nuanced relationships. And when it comes to really uh, uh, m matching educational resources, um, competencies, curriculum, lessons, uh, certifications to one another. Uh, honestly, the biggest issue is in the nuanced pieces. Um, and so being able to capture that is really key um, within a particular discipline, but also being able to move across disciplines. Um, one of the big uh, uh, challenges, and I sort of chose of all the items that we were going to discuss uh, here, um, is this issue of sort of an intentional versus an implied relationship. Um, so often when we create uh, uh, learning resources, we have a particular intent when we design that. And uh, 
often when we do that, uh, we associate metadata with it. And it's very easy to say so that something is digital. I mean, we, we pretty much all know that it doesn't mean that you're doing it on your digits, but that it's digital electronic. Um, and, uh, but when it comes to using terms like book, um, there's a lot of contextual issues around how to use that kind of information. And similarly, when you're looking at a competency, um, it's easy in many cases to say this competency is often people say is met by, but I would say is addressed by um, a particular lesson or resource or the like. And yet um, that intentional description often really, um, uh, really consists of a lot of smaller decisions that are really being made that often are, are hidden in that process. So we tend to believe that the intentional is better than the inferred um, because I've physically looked at it and I've made that decision. And yet when you're looking at a community that's actually consuming these kinds of information, um, the latter process, the one of actually describing through component parts is more transparent about the intent and captures that kind of intent. And uh, again, the nuanced aspect of how we do that is, uh, is fundamental, but we'll get a chance to show at least some of that to you. Um, We've significantly enhanced the implementation by coupling sort of a human process with an AI process. Uh, it's our contention that you really can't remove the human from that process because we bring those biases with us. And sometimes we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we remove the bias? And yet in this case, you have to capture the bias. Um, uh, without bias, you don't really capture the intent. Um, and uh, that's really essential. So we like to think about this as not a being necessarily human or AI, but really um, bionic, which of course makes everybody think about people with eyes and all that other fancy electronic stuff. But nope, it's simpler than that and easy to do. Um, uh, Matchmaker Education Labs has a describe once technology that allows you to be able to describe something once and then it becomes applicable <clears throat> and can identify its relationships to all different places in the market, um, whether that's uh, K-12, higher ed, um, uh, in, in uh, professional uh, learning, uh, around workplace and the like. So um, be able to represent a whole variety of different kinds of resources and assets. So uh, this is, for those of you who know me, this is a joke I like to tell, never metadata we didn't like. Um, and uh, as, as Brant mentioned, we've been involved with LRMI from early on and uh, we incorporate many LRMI properties um, to describe different kinds of learning assets. So I started mentioning those competencies or curriculum standards, learning resources, courses, lessons, certifications, job requirements. I mean, you can get a sense as about sort of how broad but we can describe anything that is competency-based. And uh, I think that's a key aspect. When we think about that, that, um, that uh, uh, property of teaches um, that we've heard the prior speakers talk about, the intent in many cases is to overtly state what it teaches. Our, our, our intent is to, again, make use of the LRMI properties, but really when it comes to teaching, um, is that we have a dynamic methodology for filling that in so that it actually relates to the context in which the user is, is looking at that kind of information and they can dynamically um, change that, see how that changes without having to go through all the effort of making that change on an ongoing basis. I think we're to you, Brand. Yes. We are to the demo, yes. So I am going to bring on the demo screen and let you take a look at it. So we're going to, I'm going to start with this scenario and then we're going to diverge from it. We're not going to stay too faithful uh, to the to the scenario, but but we'll at least start with it. So we're uh, we've got an educator working on uh, assembling course material uh, to teach. Um, content. This particular educator is uh, located in the United States uh, where uh, in, an, in, a, in a state that uses the Common Core. And so uh, they're going to look up uh, using a Common Core identifier 8.ee.b.5. Um, and uh, that eight happens to be, stand for eighth grade and EE is expressions and equations and so on. And so they looked that up and sure enough, we're able to find the Common Core standard uh, on that. It's in the mathematics domain. And you can see that what we've done here is we've marked up, this is what we call a descriptor. It's a descriptor, a descriptor of an educational element. 
And, uh, and an educational element for us is a competency, a learning resource, an activity, uh, any of uh, all of those categories of things that Steve was talking about. Uh, an element is simply the catch-all for all of those kinds of things. So we've got an educational element in this case that is a competency statement. It, it, it comes from the Common Core, which is published by the CCSSO. And, uh, and this, the abstract is the actual statement of this particular uh, competency, what they're trying to do. So they're, uh, this is graphing proportional relationships uh, and so on. Now you can imagine, uh, and by the way, this URL is the official URL uh, published by the Common Core uh, for referencing this. So you can imagine then that uh, there would be an, a learning resource somewhere that would, uh, in their teaches field, which is LRMI, uh, would have that particular URL. And, and then we could match up this competency statement against that learning resource. But uh, what we found is that that one-to-one -one matching is, is less than perfect. Uh, it, it works, uh, but it doesn't always uh, get you what you're looking for. And so we're going to show some ways of, of staying within the, uh, the LRMI and the Dublin Core space while expanding uh, what we're able to search for. So uh, first off, you'll notice that uh, these terms here uh, are drawn from the Dublin Core and from LRMI. In particular, um, teaches and education level are, are both uh, LRMI terms and the balance of these are uh, schema.org, Dublin Core, They're, they really overlap both of those uh, as we've marked up this particular uh, descriptor of, of some content. But you'll also notice that we have this uh, fairly complicated looking uh, URL uh, there behind the teaches. And we'll go ahead and click on that and interpret that one. And this tells us, actually, this is a key into the intermediary that describes this particular resource in terms of these very fine grained uh, um, uh, uh, competency uh, statements. So uh, you have, you know, finding the slope of a line using proportions to solve problems and so forth. All of those uh, little details are involved in this particular common core standard. And so when I look at that, I can say, well, great, let me see what kind of matches I can find on that. So I'll do that match. And, uh, and now we're over here and, and we're able to say, okay, here are a number of matches from our uh, database that uh, to some degree or another uh, fit with uh, what we were starting with. Well, you can see the 100% uh, percent match is itself. Uh, no surprise there, it matched itself. Uh, but we have a 69% match here of another competency statement also from the Common Core, which is talking about using similar triangles to explain why the slope is the same between any two distinct points, uh, which is related to that graphing of proportional relationships. Uh, this is kind of uh, what we want to do now is we're going to filter this down because we want to look at other competency statements. And we're going to, again, we have the same first two, but a few others uh, dropped out as we did that filter. And here we come across um, one of the ni interesting things about it being in a country as crazy as the United States is that uh, we don't uh, have nationwide standards. And so this is from the Texas Educational Standards um, and, uh, and we have a similar competency statement. So we've been able to then span from the uh, Common Core, which is used in many states, to the Texas standard of using similar right triangles. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, see what matches we might find on that. So we're gonna cascade over, and this time we're looking for learning resources uh, that are going to teach uh, this particular competency or set of competencies. And, uh, and we come across here, we've got a slope of a straight line, we've got visualizing linear functions, and uh, this looks like a, uh, a good idea of one to take a look at. And so I'll actually look at that learning resource itself. It comes from Math Planet. And what do you know, we're, we're back to that right triangle using the right triangle uh, uh, with the hypotenuse to describe the slope of a linear equation and, and a way of interpreting that. So this, this whole system uh, comes together. So uh, basically what we're trying to describe here is that we can take uh, learning resources 
sources of all sorts or educational elements as I was describing and, uh, and correlate them, not just one-to-one -one or, ex uh, or describe exact matches, but we can actually show that degree of match uh, between things. And, and as Michael was saying, you describe once, you create one of these uh, teaches links and you can um, match up to a number of different domains in terms of the competency frameworks. And I'll take a, a, an aside here for a moment because we've talked a bit about competency frameworks here. And, and I've got two of them up on the screen at the moment. We've got the Common Core Antiques. Turns out there are a number of state standards. Then we have standards for higher education. We have standards for job descriptions and so on. Uh, we're excited to show how those all tie together, but we depend on a lot of other work. And there's, there's a great project out there called the Open Competency Framework Collaborative uh, that the T3 Innovation Network is sponsoring. And what they're working to do is create a central directory of all of these competency frameworks. I've had the privilege of working with Steve, who presented a short, a short time ago, Steve Midgley, uh, on that uh, framework. But uh, I want to make sure that, that we give a shout out to that project also, because this prospect of, of spanning competency frameworks or taking a credential that's defined in terms of one competency framework, translating that to another one uh, is, is going to be really critical as we move forward with all of that. So really that's the extent of the demo that we have right now. What I'm going to do is flip back to our slide deck and uh, we've just got a, a, a quick wrap up. Um, and Michael, maybe you can describe what we're talking about here with our balloon. I like that. This is kind of a wrap up. Um, the, the balloon is a metaphor. I don't know how many of you have recently done paper mache, but um, if, 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 uh, if you remember, you're using strips of paper to describe the shape of the balloon. And we talk about describing not a specific concept, but rather a conceptual space. Um, with our matchmaker technology. So um, instead of taking a whole piece of paper and wrapping it around the balloon, which does a really crappy job describing the shape of that balloon in the space, um, we essentially take knowledge and break it up into these smaller pieces and do this. Now, um, uh, we limited what you had access to see. There's a lot more under the hood there. And again, um, right now we're still proprietary. We're working on that. We'd be happy to share any of that um, with, with uh, anybody, because we are looking for partners in that process. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go to the next slide? Yep. Um, as I mentioned, we're looking at creating community through partnerships. Um, we're gonna look at ways to integrate this into existing business models, including um, OER business models. Um, so uh, we right now have a partnership, for example, with Westchester Educational Service, Education Services. They are going to be a provider of services to publishers and others um, to do that descriptive process. Um, and we are discussing it with many, many others. We're looking at adopting this technology. We're looking for additional partners. We hope that some of you might be in touch with us. Um, we're also looking for market leaders to collaborate to expand the use of the technology in various ways. And uh, just to reiterate, the LRMI properties are a key component to our strategy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we'll, we'll leave it with that. Um, here's our contact information uh, if you want to reach out to us. And as I pointed out, uh, this is a, a system that we've put together. What we want to do is be able to open up the whole uh, matching system. It's kind of a careful step. Those of you who have been involved in open source and also uh, working on making sure that you preserve a revenue stream, it, that, that's, a, that's a balance, but we think we've got a strategy for how that works. So we want to make sure that this is an open collaborative effort and, uh, and an opportunity for us to contribute. And, uh, and again, we're extremely grateful to all the effort and what we wanted to show you here in the context of LRMI is that uh, LRMI is foundational uh, to what we're doing, as are the other metadata standards uh, and, and what we're doing in the, that ability to exchange all of that information. Hopefully you will see how you can apply these same fundamental uh, metadata principles uh, to your projects. Thanks. And I think, Phil, it goes back to you, right? It does, yes. Thank you, Brent. And thank you, Michael. Um, I nearly clicked on the leave button instead of the share screen button there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have some time for questions and answers. I'd like to remind all of the attendees to um, put questions into the chat window and to note whether they'd like to ask the question themselves um, or otherwise I shall read it. Um, 
as chair, I take the privilege of getting to ask the first question, but not actually to have to answer it. So I want to ask all the other pa panelists, um, what did you find to be the most significant or the most useful thing that LOMI brought to your implementation? And optionally, if you're feeling a little bit more um, critical of it, um, what would you change or add to LOMI? So I think I'll take, well, Steve, do you want to kick off on that? Sure, I just, uh, we did outline this in, in the presentation a little bit, but um, the, the ability to start from this sort of basal vocabulary, which was LRI and schema.org, meant that there was, we moved very quickly into the specifics of the problem that we were trying to describe, which is characterizing content internal to a single uh, learning resource. Uh, so just, and, and I've had this experience both on this project and others, that just being able to start from that basal vocabulary where you want to talk about education, start here and then extend that profiling down into greater detail is, you know, is basically invaluable at this point. So I don't think I'd ever work on a learning metadata project again that doesn't base off of you know, these sort of core vocabs that we're using on the web. Um, the, the critical c voice would be that um, better validation of the data would be helpful, that having more tools and capabilities to validate and sort of manage the data would be nice. There's some out there, but it's, it's imperfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brent, Michael, do you have anything to add? I, I think, Phil, the, it's nice to see some of this beginning to settle down because um, uh, the, the LRMI certainly isn't the first. And, you know, I'd like to say it'll be the last, but I don't say in my career that that's the case. But um, uh, I, I think coming to some common agreement that these are the valuable properties and how we're going to define those is going to be key for this community to move ahead. So. Uh, I think that's the, the important role of the LRMI. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll also mention uh, I'm involved, as several of the, this group are, in uh, the IEEE Learning Technology Standards Council, which just recently, um, the Learning Object Metadata Standard is, is an LTSC standard, and according to LTSC or, or IEEE processes, those have to be renewed or else they expire. And uh, so a committee just opened on learning object metadata and uh, which uh, is really parallel and, and attempts to address the same things as LRMI. And uh, indeed the committee is saying the LRMI structure is simpler and easier to work with. And so uh, our expectation is that uh, we're going to see some convergence uh, in the LOM and the LRMI and the other efforts in this community. Yeah, I think that would help. And, and I think the, the simplicity of LRMI goes back to uh, what I showed from the Dublin Core Education Working Group's domain yeah. model of separating out just those bits that relate to educational characteristics. Mm -hmm. Adrian, would, would you like to add anything? What the best thing about schema.org, it's, yeah, it, about LMI, it's part of schema.org and people know schema, schema.org and yeah, that's uh, really an asset. <laughs> and so, yeah, and I, I, yeah, I don't see any competing standard I would use. And yeah, we, and the uh, yeah things we could put some more work in, but we're doing this right now is uh, yeah about selling LMI. I think um, we could do a better job at mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 on the web and how how it is presented and all this these things. Yeah, and we we have a question from the audience. Um, if there were one or two LRMI fields that search engines were to adopt, which would be the most beneficial for users? What would they be? I think that follows on quite nicely from Adrian's comment about LRMI as part of schema.org. And you know, one of the big roles of schema.org is um, it's used by big search engines, but at the moment um, they don't use 
uh, any of the specific LOMI properties for um, educational products. Um, I personally, think I think. <laughs> Go ahead, Brad. We're all jumping in. Uh, personally, I, I we'll, uh, hopefully we'll have different opinions. That way, you'll you'll get some variety. But uh, but I think what was uh, originally an educational alignment, and then we've simplified that into the teaches and assesses fields. Uh, of, of anything out of LRMI, I would love to see those adopted broadly. Here, here. Uh, from my perspective. Um, yeah, the educational use uh, and the typical age range are values that mm -hmm. I find are very useful. Um, and if they were broadly, I mean, part of the question is not just the search engines adopted them, but as a result of the search engines adopted them, many, many people start to use them. So there's much more markup available in those fields. That, that would be the point uh, for me. Yeah, I don't think I can add anything different to that. Uh, I, I think it's the alignment to the, the frameworks that teachers actually use when they're, when they're teaching um, that's important. Um, and the, I mean the, the difficulty with doing that is that um, different countries, different states within countries, even different school systems within states use different frameworks for their curriculum. So um, the, the, there is a problematic thing there of trying to get the um, tr trying to get that to work at scale. Well, I think, uh, if I may, that's one of the benefits of Matchmaker is that it uh, it helps us crosswalk that dynamically um, without having to have us bear the weight of all of that. I do, I do also want to add. We've talked largely about the benefits to the consumer of the data um, as in a traditional sense, which may be the educator and hopefully increasingly the learner themselves. But I think also those who are creating new resources, um, uh, uh, the ability to be able to look at and uh, understand the intent of these competency frameworks and be able to use that to help design better learning resources is a key component to this as well. And the LRMI and the encoding that's there um, can be very, very helpful in that process. Okay, we had a question from Paul Walk. Um, Paul, I hope you don't mind me identifying you, but uh, <laughs> since you're one of the um, conference organizers, um, please, I thought- Please you, go uh, ahead. Might, might want to, <laughs> I have done. <laughs> um, might want to phrase the question yourself. <laughs> Paul, do you, do you want to ask the question yourself? Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, so I, I was very struck by something which uh, Michael said. I, I've slightly paraphrased him, but he, I think what he was saying was with, without understanding bias, you can't capture intent. Um, that's the first time I've ever heard that expressed that way. And um, the, the notion of bias in metadata is, is a very topical issue right now and, and usually uh, couched in sort of terms of it being a, a problem that we need to somehow mitigate. Um, but I, so I think this is a really, well, for me, this is a profoundly interesting idea that actually bias is something that um, it, it's, a, it's an aspect of metadata that in some context we need to be, um, uh, we need to bring to the foreground and be, and be aware of and actually um, incorporate into our sort of processes and so on. So I'm sorry, I don't really have a specific question except to, I'd just love to hear more about that and, and what views um, some of the other people, uh, panelists might have, because it seems to me to be probably quite important in the context of um, some of the um, solutions that you've been describing today. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example, Paul, that I think you'll find enlightening, and that is that we were on a call with a potential partner, and uh, we were talking about competency statements and how to represent those. And I made the statement that because two competency statements are identical in not just their concept, but in fact, exactly worded the same, even though they come from two places, that that does not mean that they in, mean the same thing. And the lead person on the call said, well, what do you mean? That, of course they mean the same thing. You can map those 100% to one another. And fortunately, one of the other people who worked for that person said, 
No, not really. It really depends on the context in which it was created. And that's really the intent of what we're doing. I think that really means about getting to the bias and the underlying intent rather than just looking at the, the actual words on the page or screen. And it's said several times uh, in, in this, but, uh, but I'll make it explicit. Context is where you find that, right? And, and that's why, you, why a word for word thing might be different is which context in which it's presented. So that's where you find the bias. And, and so it, it, this is where metadata just keeps working. You can use metadata to describe the context as well as the uh, item itself. Um, we also had a question relating to um, uh, encoding competency statements, um, which is um, asking about the use of the Achievement Standards Network, ASN model. Um, so, uh, Michael Grant, would you care to say ahead, anything Brian. about that? Sure. Um, so, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, I made that plug for the Open Competency Framework Collaborative. Um, the uh, participants in that effort, uh, and, and, my, and Steve may chime in before I'm done as well here, uh, uh, include the Achievement Standards Network, uh, the CASE Network, and uh, Credential Engine, uh, and we're, we're seeking other participants in that. But uh, Achievement Standards Network is probably the oldest and, and most uh, and richest collection of competency frameworks uh, that we have. It is a K-12 biased because that's where it started from. So you have the, uh, the standards from the 50 US states and, and then some, uh, a number of international standards for uh, the primary and secondary education. But then it also has uh, professional learning standards uh, for uh, certifications in several professional organizations and uh, some higher education uh, competency frameworks. Uh, and I'll say just in general, part of the reason that uh, you can go across all of the different collections and, uh, to try and find competency frameworks, you're going to find very few in higher ed. And that's because most higher educational institutions develop their own and they don't share them. Uh, that's a problem that we need to try and address. Right. Others have cited the OCF CoLab work above in the chat, and that's uh, what Brant's referring to, Stuart Sutton's on the call also. Um, uh, and I think the project that Brant and Michael have presented, you know, is, is stitching together and providing utility on top of these types of um, metadata interoperability initiatives, mm -hmm. if I understand it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what we're trying to do wouldn't be possible without the other efforts going on. And um, yeah, Stuart Sutton has made the point uh, in, in the chat. Um, Stuart Sutton's one of the, uh, well, yeah, the, the prime motivator, I think, between a, behind ASN and has made massive contributions to LRMI as well. Um, the context is only, always important. The competency string understands the colors, color spectrum, means different things in art instruction and physics instruction, which as a physicist, I can, I can absolutely agree with. <laughs> Um, I have a question for Adrian. Um, Adrian, you mentioned that um, ScoHub um, used um, GitHub repositories in order to store the competency schemes. And um, I, I know that you uh, made a fork of the LRMI repository that holds the, the competency schemes that we've created for use with LRMI, the, not the competency schemes, the, the, the concept schemes that we've created for use with LRMI properties. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what are the requirements for a GitHub repository that, so that it can be used with Scohub? Um, yeah, basically um, you have to, the, the repos are the same. You have to publish a turtle file or more than one turtle file there. Um, it's very basic. We don't support uh, uh, SCOS XL, XL or so. It's just uh, the, the usual SCOS with some Dublin Core metadata for the vocabulary itself. And then you in the settings, you have to set the webhook. Uh, and for now, you would have, if you want to publish it via scohub.io, you would have to ask us for the secret to put in there in the settings. Uh, otherwise, you can set up your 
own SCOHUB instance, like uh, Stefan Röckin, who's also here, he did this um, for, for their vocabularies uh, in, in a school context. Um, and yeah, then you can, uh, it already supports multi uh, uh, different languages uh, in the metadata. Uh, we have to implement it in the HTML. And um, yeah, so it's, it's a plain and simple SCOS file as turtle uh, is, is enough. And if you encounter any problems, um, ask us on uh, in the uh, SCOHUB vocabs GitHub repo and we will take a look. Can you have more than one concept scheme in the repository? Yeah, you can have two turtle files, two uh, concept scheme. I might perhaps, uh, I think Stefan, he published several vocabs for one repository. Stefan, you might, perhaps you can put the link into the chat. Then you can see um, how you can use it. Um, I'm not that quick. Okay, okay, that, that, that's great. Well, well you will put Stephen. one there and then, ah, yeah, there it is. And then, yeah. Okay, hi, thanks very much. Um, it's one example and, right. There's been a fair amount of discussion in the chat window that I'm not going to try and summarize as a, as a question um, and I believe we're coming towards the end of our scheduled sh slot. Um, so I just want to ask each of the panelists um, if there's anything else that they would like to add that has to, to what we've been discussing and what's been discussed in the chat window. I'll just mention that uh, the chat does become part of the recording, which is good because I think there's a, a lot of rich information out there. So uh, I'm glad we'll have that for reference going forward. Yeah. And uh, tell people about LRMI um, and feel free to point them to any of us. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to get back to them, let them know how they better use of LRMI. That's right. Yeah, Co contact us. Um, we're, we're all members of the um, LOMI task group. Um, I have a reminder on the um, the screen share of the task group mailing list, which you can join. And um, basically, if you join the mailing list, you've joined the task group. You'll get um, information and reminders about the monthly calls. Um, and if you're interested but um, don't want to make such a commitment. Um, join the Google group and we'll send you updates. Um, so a thank you from me to um, my um, fellow panelists. Thank you all for um, giving your time to make this happen. Thank you all for your contributions to LOMI. Um, thank you to everybody who's attended and um, listened to us. I hope you found it a, a good use of your, of your time on a, on a Friday. Um, and finally, thanks once again to um, Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, first of all, for hosting LOMI and giving us um, a, a venue in which to continue our development. And um, secondly, for um, the DCMI virtual conference and giving us a chance to talk about LOMI. <laughs>